Bruce, welcome, and thanks for speaking to our group today. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we have, I'm going to have to shut these lights off if we could. We have some signal. So far, so good. And if we didn't have signal, we'd use whiteboard or whatever we have. So I hopefully this isn't too distracting, although it may be. And if we can just, if that is distracting, we can just uh, go raw with this. But um, so it's good to be here. I ran the, the loop this morning, and uh, it's amazing how much ice is out there. Fascinating stuff. So um, we're going to cover a lot of territory today. Um, this today is um, a kind of a hybrid. It is a workshop mixed with some theory, mixed with some very practical notions. And um, I'm going to take you a little bit through the journey that I've had with regards to understanding this concept of leadership development. And I'm, I'm assuming that some of you or all of you uh, ask the question, you know, what is leadership and can I become a better leader? Anybody interested in becoming a more effective leader in your life, okay? Now, how many of you already consider yourselves leaders? Okay. I'm going to wait. I'm always fascinated to see how quickly or how slowly individuals raise their hand because some have, you know, these very clear roles of, you know, I'm currently playing as a leader. Others don't quite know if they're in a leadership position or is it a position or is it something I do automatically. Let me ask a, a different question. How many of you have ever had to lead a sibling in something? How many of you have ever had to lead a pet to uh, something? How many of you ever had to get out of bed in the morning? Right? So you've had to lead yourself. Right? So, now leadership is a confusing topic, and I'm going to try to make it less confusing today, but I want to, before I jump into this broader spectrum of leadership, uh, we're going to focus quite heavily today on leading self. And so, three big questions with regards to leadership that I think a lot of people ask is, number one, are leaders born or made? Anybody have the answer to that question? There's actually one answer to that question. Yes. Yes. Yes, they're first born and then they're made, they're right? Born. Nature nurture debate. What's the what are we where are we at in our scientific inquiry of genes versus environment? What's our what's our current verdict? Based changes based on the literature, but it's about 50/50. So, you come to this world somewhat pre-baked. But you got 50% of variability. You think about that. Each of you in the room has a unique genetic code coming from parents, grandparents, great-grandparents. You come with this beautiful soup of your, uh, history of, your, of your ancestors. But within this lifespan, and I'm going to give you my favorite number, and I won't tell you what it is until the end, my favorite number is 788,400. See if you can think about what that is. So you've got this lifespan from which to exercise influence or to, to do things. And throughout your lifespan, you have a tremendous capacity to grow and evolve and give that to the next generation. So first, leaders are born, then made. Can I become a better leader? The absolute answer is yes. You can become a better leader. And the literature says that you can because most of the things we do in leadership are learnable. Now, can you be the very best at every aspect of leadership? Maybe not. But I compare leadership to tennis, because that's where I sort of came into understanding this concept of leadership. I've seen amazingly gifted and talented tennis players. And in fact, I remember back, uh, this predates me, but um, I don't know if you know that Minnesota probably had one of the very most talented tennis players in the history of the game, Back in the middle 70s, a guy by the name of Howard Schoenfield. He was um, from, I believe, Rochester. He was the very best tennis player in the world. Very talented. Beat John McEnroe as a junior. Number one in the world. Kind of gave up the game for a while. Uh, came back to started playing lightly and beat John McEnroe again in the juniors to be number one in the world. 
and then sort of dropped off the face of the earth and nobody ever heard of him again. Then we have other cases where we have very C-level talent like Jimmy Connors uh, and others who really, really worked hard and uh, became the best in the world but weren't the most gifted and talented. It's the same with leadership. We come in with certain sort of uh, capacities and we have the ability to improve those capacities. Question is then, how do you do it? I want to start it by saying making sense of leadership for me looks a lot like this. We kind of know leadership when we see it, but we don't really know what it is, right? People will say, well, yeah, that person's a leader, that person's not a leader, that piece of person's a winner, that person's a loser. You know, we, have the, we see all these broad pieces. And I call it the butterflies and the clouds theory, where there are literally hundreds, if not thousands, of variables that include, that are part of leadership, but we don't necessarily know what to do with them. You know, if I ask you, what do you think, what's inside of leadership, what would you say? What's in leadership? Throw out a few things. What are, what are some of those butterflies in the equation of leadership? This is a participatory event, by the way. Confidence. Okay, confidence. Vocal. What's that? Vocal leaders. Vocal, so they have the ability to communicate. Right? Speaking, maybe? Yeah, what else? Integrity. Integrity? That's, a, that's an abstraction, right? What else? Accountability. Accountability, okay. So they account to other people or systems. All of these words are, have lots of substructure to them as well. What else? Passion. Charisma, passion. Then we could go on forever, right? So the question is, doesn't it get confusing when you think, I want to be a better leader, and there's all these pieces, and where do you begin? So my hope, <coughs> in this hour and 40 minutes, I'm going to try to provide you a construct, a map, a way of navigating through this. And all of the tools I talk about, all the, you know, all the stuff, the specific, um, you know, how do I do it and the tools, I'm going to give you those after. Okay, for those who want them. Right now, we're going to talk more about how do you map this stuff out, where do you start, how do you make sense of leadership, and then how do I do it better. It looks a lot like this to me, going from the butterflies to the vehicle. There's all these moving parts. Each part has a certain type of value to it. But some parts are more valuable than others based upon uh, what you need. If you strip down a car and say, well... You know, I want to race my friend in a desert and I need to strip out everything that's not valuable. You can pull a lot of stuff out of a car and um, still make it work, right? But all the little pieces make it a little bit better, a little bit better. And so I'm going to kind of start off by saying that leadership is a lot about understanding systems. Human systems, technical systems, um, and then we get into some pretty ethereal stuff. This is, for me, kind of a 25-year quest. I'm not going to go into all the details about it, but I've tried to, over the last 25 years, make sense of lots of different sort of literatures and how they fit together and make it really, really, really practical for students, for inner-city kids, for executives, um, for anybody. And that's been my quest. So, making sense of theory. So, I'm going to start off with a definition. There's thousands of definitions of leadership. This is mine. Take it or leave it. Um, this is how I see leadership, but I take it very broadly. I call it the iceberg definition of leadership. And for me, we should almost take away the word leadership because it almost directs your attention. When I think about leadership, how many of you, when you think about leadership, your first image is something like a CEO or a senator? You know, it's somebody out there. It's like me. I'm just a brother. I'm just a nobody. I'm just a, you know, I work in a restaurant. I'm not really a leader. Well, the fact is you are. And I'm even going to compel you to recognize that if, even if you choose not to lead, you are leading by influence. Have you ever thought that if I don't say anything, I'm not communicating? How many of you have ever thought, if I just don't say anything then I'm not really communicating. But realizing that by not talking, you're communicating. You're kind of in the game anyway. So I'm going to make the um, assertion here that even if you say, well, I don't really want to go be a leader, you're, you're in the room, you're leading, you're influencing, whether it be 
by your absence of leadership or your leadership. So you're in the game. So the question is, what do you want to do with the game you have, with the arena that you're going to go into, and then how to be an effective influencer in that space? So for me, leadership is really about developing your capacity to influence. Influence is a big, fat, juicy word with lots of pieces underneath it. But what are you seeking to influence? I see that people are trying to influence, number one, themselves. How many of you have wanted to influence yourself better? Lose weight, better attitude, quit a habit, stop you know, self-criticism, negative self-talk, all that stuff. So we influence ourselves for good or for bad all the time. At the least, I had, a one, I had this woman... Um, I spoke to who said, I don't want to be in a relationship, I don't want to be in a team, I don't care about the organization, you know, I don't want any, I don't need to lead. I said, well, do you just want to lead yourself better? Well, I'd like to do that better. Great, then you're in the leadership game just as we are. So we lead oneself and we lead others in the pursuit of individual, so ourself, in relationships, in teams, in organizations, and in communities, whether those communities are regional, national, or international. And we do that in our meaningful life arenas. And I use that word, those words, meaningful life arena, because when I first started off in grad school, I started off studying psychology. I wanted to know as an athlete, and you'll find out later that I was not, you know, when I started off early in life, I was not a student. I had no interest in school whatsoever. Um, until I discovered tennis. And one day I just decided I was going to start playing tennis. And I started playing tennis and I realized that by hitting tennis balls I could exercise influence and I could learn things like grit and goals and vision and how to read situations and how to develop strategies. So I got really interested in the psychology of elite performers. And I started reading a lots of sports psychology. And then it went into a lot of the um, positive psychology literature. And then when I went to graduate school, I studied counseling psychology with an emphasis in sport and human effectiveness. But then I saw a broader, uh, broader base. And so I went and worked for a while and decided to go the MBA route. So I went and studied business administration, but realized that business for business sake wasn't that juicy. You know, finance, accounting, yeah, it's fine. But I really wanted to understand... How do you engineer human beings inside of an organization? You know, those are the performers of the organization. So after business school, I went to a consulting firm and we did sort of the applied human performance and leadership using sport as a metaphor and training executives and managers on how to facilitate self-performance and the performance of others. And while doing that, I went and did my doctoral research and my doctoral work. And I studied this interesting little topic called flow. And I realized, there's an old story, we don't have enough time because this is normally a six to eight hour workshop that I do, but um, I've had experiences of flow when I was younger, and we're going to talk about that because we're going to start today with the concept of leadership with you in mind. We're going to do kind of a micro workshop, okay? And I want you to realize that your meaningful life arena, whether you're starting to be a nurse, educator, business executive, stay-at-home dad, stay-at-home mom, engineer, fighter pilot, ballerina... You know, police and firefighters, they all are in their leadership space. But I wanted to start by recognizing that, you know, there's lots of guru models of leadership out there. There's, how many of you have seen, there's literally four or 5,000 new book titles coming out every year on leadership. How many of you have read some common and popular leadership books? More than three. How many of you see that most of those are highly redundant in their concept frames, right? They're butterflies, it's the uh, same notes, same instruments, different rock star, different stage, different day. Principles of leadership have been around since the written, the writings of, you know, <laughs> history of mankind, okay? But I, well, first thing I wanted to point out is that when we study leadership, just like any type of knowledge, we start off within a particular arena or a discipline. So let's say within a discipline of leadership, we want to study uh, time management. Let's take that. Underneath the concept of time management, we want to understand if we've done the research, 
we go to the research to identify what are the principles, what are the laws, what are the concepts, what's the current knowledge we know that actually works if we understand it. How do we then use models and representations and schemas and illustrations and stories to make sense of knowledge? Usually when we do that, we're seeing some type of interconnected systems. The world's filled with interconnected systems. Physical systems, economic systems, financial systems, biological systems, social systems, family systems, internal systems, and external systems. Really, we're studying systems and processes. But at the very bottom is us as human beings trying to influence stuff. We got ten, ten, ten fingers, ten toes, we got lips, we got mouth. We're here to influence the world, but the world is full of systems. So how do you influence properly? And we all experiment. We try stuff, stuff doesn't work, stuff does work. We do research on it and find out, ah, oh, this works better. Try this particular principle, this particular tool. So leadership first is the recognition that some stuff works, some stuff doesn't work. Go to the most advanced and modern research to find out what works. And so we are full of systems. The world is full of systems. We create systems that mimic our environment. And we try to influence those systems. So our goal is high performance. Our goal is to lead better. How do we lead better? Well, first of all, we have to start with awareness building. Um, when I work with students, I've always discovered that, you know, 85% of education is awareness. Because once you're aware, you then can realize what you don't know and go learn it and start doing something differently. So what we're going to do for a while, for about 25 minutes, is I'm going to um, open your aperture a bit. And I'm going to watch you, and I'm going to watch some of you start to go either to sleep, or I'm going to start watching you start glazing over because it's too much stuff. And I'm going to talk to you about why this happens. But I want to invite you, it's kind of like going through the atmosphere. You know, you're kind of, you know, you're burning, the heat shields are holding on, but I'm going to try to stretch your awareness and sensitivity to various principles and maps. But then we're going to dig right into narrowing down the focus and getting very concrete about you. And then I'm going to give you some tools to address your one thing, okay? And we're going to get to this your one thing concept. Now, self-mastery, very simple model. We start off in almost any discipline unconsciously incompetent. We don't know what we don't know, right? The greatest thing we can do for ourselves is go from unconsciously incompetent to consciously incompetent. When you first realize that your, a whole new world opens to you, now you can have choice or agency to do something about that. Our goal for the moment is just to raise your conscious incompetence. How many of you feel like you're consciously incompetent in an area? Like you've just started a new class or a new major, and you, you realize that you really don't know anything, and it's kind of frustrating, right? It happens all the time, right? And then over, over the course of time, you're going to develop some conscious competence. And then we're going to talk a little bit about what does it mean to develop unconscious competence, where you can do something without thinking about it. How many of you do anything unconsciously competently? What is it you do unconsciously competently? I think driving. Yes. You, anybody ever driven to school or driven to work and forgotten how you got there? Right? That's what we want to be doing in the leadership space, is being able to identify your one thing, shifting you from unconscious incompetence, getting you to a place where you can uh, use very clear practices to become consciously competent, and baking it into your DNA so it goes from being something you value to something that's now a virtue, where you then can move on to the next thing. So we're going to talk about how leadership is iterative. It's, ev it's evolving. It's a lifelong pursuit of advancing certain understandings and certain skills and tools. Okay, so some of you may have seen this video, but why are we unconsciously incompetent about so much in leadership? And there's a little video here called Inattentional Blindness. And I want you just to watch this and make sure the sound is okay. Hopefully it is. And if it's not, we will adjust it. OK. 
Okay, so this is really low. Let me just... Um, You ready? Yep. Count how many times the players wearing white pass the ball. Did you spot the gorilla? For people who haven't seen or heard about a video like this before, about half missed the gorilla. If you knew about the gorilla, you probably saw it. But did you notice the curtain <coughs> changing color or the player on the black team leaving the game? Let's rewind and watch it again. Here comes the gorilla, and there goes a player, and the curtain is changing from red to gold. When you're looking for a gorilla, you often miss other unexpected events. Okay, so why is that relevant? It's relevant <clears throat> in that when we want to improve performance, when we want to improve leadership, when we want to improve anything, uh, our brain naturally filters out lots and lots of things. And until we develop an awareness of it, we don't see it. It's physiological, it's in our brain. So my goal today is to raise your awareness. And then we're going to drill down. So I ask you this question. I use the athletes to begin this concept because we're going to talk about self-leadership first. The workshop that I do is called Finding Your Flow. And my goal for you is that you start recognizing the power of attention. And then we're going to take this concept of how to um, improve your attention and focus. And then we're going to apply it to a broader base of leadership development. But first we're going to talk a little bit about, about leading self. So let me ask you, this particular individual is ready to run a race. Can you think about what are some of the things that she has done to get ready for this moment, this single moment in time? What skills, competencies, attitudes, perspectives, whatever, does it take for her to run this race at the level of uh, an expert? What would it take? Yeah? Physical conditioning. Okay, so physical conditioning, technical conditioning, physical conditioning. So there's physical systems involved in her, right? Yeah? Self-motivation. Cool. So the motivation, okay, so how would you do self-motivation? Uh, set goals. Okay, so goal setting, yeah. Visualization. So visualization, a mental activity of simulated success, simulating, you know, the pre-rituals and stuff, yep. What else? Practice. Practice, iteration, right? That's one of the keys, yep. Anything else? Knowledge of her specific. The knowledge of the race, okay. So understanding the history of the race or understanding what kind of race, knowing if you're running the 15 or the 8, right? Okay, now we can go on like this like the butterflies. There's lots and lots of skills, okay? So one of the things I wanted to mention which really intrigued me was back in the 60s. We have this inordinate number of um, people winning the gold medal out of East Germany and Russia. Now in the 60s, was East Germany a very flourishing place to live? It was not. So what do you think accounted for... Now, people have two answers for this. Doping and cheating. Let's take those out for a minute, because those may have been the case a little bit. But what were the East Germans and the Russians doing different than the rest of the world at the time? Trying to find control. What's that? Trying to find control. In a sense, yes. They were practicing multi and multi-methods. Most of the world was just doing their craft well. Think about yourself as students. You know, GPA MCAT score, GPA LSAT score, 
It used to be 20 years ago, GPA LSAT. What, my, what law school am I going to get into? <clears throat> now, medical school, it's GPA, MCAT, leadership. Why? Why isn't it just your craft? Why isn't it just your knowledge that gets you to that high level of performance? Anybody ever work for somebody who is really, really smart and a really, really bad manager? Yes. Anybody know anybody who is brilliant? Howard Schoenfield? Committed suicide? Drug overdose? Couldn't take it? There's lots of brilliant drunks. Lots of brilliant... So knowledge isn't enough. It takes an entire swath of human skills to actually do the technical stuff well. You know, 15 years ago, we started studying doctors, especially doctors that were getting sued by their patients versus not getting sued. <coughs> this was one of the biggest variables for doctors who weren't getting sued by their patients. Empathy, listening, understanding the mistake, copying up to it. Right? So there's, there's human skills that are next to the technical skills. So I want to ground us for a minute in this concept of, you know, when you're at your very best um, and versus your very worst. So let's just do this quick experiment, and I'm going to jump into the models, okay? So I want you to close your eyes for a minute, and we're going to do a bit of a contrast. I'm not going to write it all down. We don't have a lot of time for it. But um, I want you to close your eyes, if you would, and I want you to think of a time where you were totally overwhelmed with your work or your life. I want you to remember a time where you lacked interest in what you were doing. What you were doing had little or no value to you. Time stood agonizingly still. You felt a sense of frustration or fear. You were not on purpose. There was a disconnect between your mind, your heart, and your body. You were overly self-conscious. There was a sense of self-doubt. And you couldn't wait to do anything else. Anybody remember a time like that? A moment? An hour? A week? A month? Raise your hand if you've ever had what I call an anti-flow experience. Everything was going wrong. Okay, grab a neighbor. Each of you, tell your story in one minute and say, what was the arena and what do you think were the principles at play? What do you think they were that made it such a rotten experience? Okay, go ahead. One minute each. <laughs> Minute, minute. Okay, let's throw it out there. So, just a couple quick stories. Um, where did it happen? What do you think caused it? You're now social scientists on yourself. The reason why I like to do this is because we're going to get into the broader aspects of leadership, but I want to get into some of the principles that show up in yourself, in relationship, in teams, and organizations that move across the system. But we're going to start 
by just focusing on the little system, which is your individual self. So where did it happen? What do you think was going on? So who's got a, I know it's sometimes personal. You don't have to say it, but what was it? Who's got a story? Nobody wants to reveal their deep, dark secrets. <laughs> yeah? Early, both of ours was educational experiences, where we were in the wrong place, and we had no interest, no passion. It just was painful. Okay, no interest, no passion. Okay. It was just painful to, to be in that. Painful because it was no interest, no passion, right? Right. Okay. Other arena? Other variables? Two more. I can start calling on people. Yeah. Um, I'd say kind of like right now, um, I have a six month old at home. So I work about 30 hours at my job and then I have two internships, full time student and full time mom. Okay. So it's been... So too, too many, too much, um, too many uh, challenges mm -hmm. happening at once, having to juggle. And you're going to bring the, the example of what we're going to get to at the end, which is what I call attentional leadership theory. You're having to attend to multiple things and try to make it all work, and it's stressing your system, right? Okay, great. One more. And then we're going to get into the opposite of this. One more story. Who's got it? Everyone's looking away now. They don't want to choose it. Yeah. So uh, when I was in graduate school, I uh, spent a lot of time working on a dissertation proposal that I wasn't really in love with. And I handed it over to my thesis advisor. And for those of us who have been in this situation, you go into this long dormancy period where you have absolutely no control uh, over what, uh, whether this thing's going to be accepted or not. So I had the, the, the two negatives of not really loving the thing I was doing and feeling like I was out of control over the, the process in general. And there's a third in there that's underneath it all. And it's an um, absence of feedback in a timely manner. So you're sitting in limbo. Stinks, right? Okay, so your, your, your guys are bringing up some of these mechanisms. Let's do the opposite now, and I want you to think about your best moment of performance you've ever had. Like the day, the moment that everything was falling into place. These are highly instructive moments. And by the way, people tend to like to shy away from their really bad moments, but they're highly instructive. You should never let a bad moment go un- unexamined, right? They're very instructive. When, when you get through this whole process of six month old school managing all this stuff, your muscles and these various types of muscles that you're building in your philosophy and your mind and your values are going to be beneficial to you, make you stronger, more resilient, and probably help others struggling with the same thing. So there's a period of pain and then there's a period of you know, strength. So let's think about that. Let's think about these phrases. Close your eyes once again. I want you to think about a time where your mind wasn't wandering. You were not thinking of something else. You were totally involved in what you were doing. Your body felt good. Nothing seemed to bother or get at you. You were less aware of your problems and yourself. The stars seemed to align and everything just fell into place. You seemed to have all of the skills you needed to do the job. You felt highly energized to be doing what you were doing. You didn't see yourself as separate from what you were doing, and time seemed to fly by. Okay, S same partner, one minute on each side, your best moment. What was the arena, and what do you think were the principles at play that led to high levels of focus and pure engagement? Okay? <laughs>
principles at play that, that uh, compelled high performance as a, an individual or in a team situation? These are the fun things to talk about, right? Where you've triumphed. Who's got a story? Yeah? Hello. Um, it was like a few years ago, like in the summer, and um, I took my Taekwondo test um, to get my black belt. Um, I was really nervous at that test, but finally I got that, and I felt so excited about that. I think it made me um, like feel a great sense of achievement because um, I, I had to do that because I only got one chance, and because of the ter- determination, and I'm uh, really passionate about that. So every time I remember that moment, I feels excited. Okay, so it was the arena of martial arts, which is one of the purest forms of where you find the zone of high function. So there was nervousness, which is good. It means you valued it like crazy. It's a little bit scary, so it puts you on kind of hyper overdrive. Yeah, you were to, determined. I to practice more to get that, so. Okay, so lots of technical practice. Um, the joy of the process. What else, anything else in there? Were you getting good feedback while you were doing it? You felt like yeah. you were... Yeah, I knew I had to be really brave. Because you can get hurt in the practice, but you had to be really brave. Okay, so you have to, you have to tap into bravery. Okay, great. What else? Yeah. I got an organizational one. I was a, a leader in an organization, and I led a, a change effort. That sort of, re, re, you know, the way we were working things, uh, the structure, the culture and all those type of things. It was uh, something that was, you know, sort of a long term, but it worked out. And I think some of the things that I got most out of that was, you know, the challenge of this thing, you know, and the accomplishment of this thing. But I've also realized that I've, I've got to make a difference. <laughs> and this is something that, uh, you know, this made a huge contribution and a big difference to the organization. Okay, so you had a, you had a, or something that was larger than yourself. Uh, it was challenging. Uh, it was compelling, and you felt like you were improving something. Right. Yeah? Okay, one last one. Anybody have a really weird one, really obscure one? I've had some really great, fascinating stories about plumbers and electricians <laughs> and rodeo riders and all sorts of great synergistic moments. Anybody has a quick one you want to share? It's not down. One more. You gonna hold out on me? So mine was defending my dissertation four years ago. Okay. So I don't know that I was at my peak performance that day, but the whole process of getting to that point. So what, what do you think about what do you what, what was going on in that moment? So it was um, the, all the preparation that went involved. Preparation. Yeah. Uh, what about when you went in the room? Did you do anything right before you entered in the room? Uh, you know, I rehearsed my presentation many times. So you so, simulated it? Yeah, okay. many times. Uh, anything else that you did? did you Anticipated know? questions from the committee. Anticipated best, questions, best so you, scenario planning? Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, did you get a good night's sleep before? Uh, probably not. Okay. <laughs> so you didn't do, it, yeah, didn't do it all right. Okay, Okay. so once again now, <laughs> what I'm going to try to do is, is I'm getting you to think about all the butterflies that are involved in your worst moments versus your best moments. My goal is how many of you would, if you could walk away, we got an hour to cover 25 more years of theory and research and models, we're gonna do it. How many of you feel like if you could identify a model and a way for you to go and extrapolate from your worst experiences in a reasonably powerful way 
and then be able to utilize those to engineer your own focus better when you want it would be a valuable skill for you over the long term. Hopefully, most of you will see this as, as important. And I'm going to give you a whole year's worth of tools to support that. But right now, we're going to talk about framework, framework, framework. Okay? So just like the athlete in preparation for the race, it's the same thing with us as professionals, whether we're whatever we're doing, building cars, blue collar, white collar, whatever it is. Same variables are at play. And what you're going to find is that when you look at getting into good graduate schools, when you look at getting the attention of really good employers, the whole concept of getting good test scores and grades is what I consider now the necessary but insufficient condition for success. 90 years ago, most people would say 90% of the value of your college education is from the classroom. Administration just kind of gets in the way of like what we do, teach. It's about 50-50 now. You know, it's the other stuff. It's the internships and it's the engaged projects and it's the human factor that we're now recognizing. When I talk to CEOs and business leaders of, of all type, I say, what are you looking for in a grad student? Or what are you looking for in a professional? The knowledge is kind of expected. I'm looking for somebody who can motivate themselves. I'm looking for somebody who can learn. I'm looking for somebody who can unlearn. I'm looking for somebody who can communicate well. I'm looking for somebody who can work well in a team. I'm looking for somebody who can, you know, see the whole system and understand where they fit and understand how to help others be at their best. They're looking for all this human stuff that most of us are really sloppy about acquiring. So I want to give you a structured way to make half of your education uh, a more reasonable process. So this is where I like to step out and say there's a difference between technical knowledge and your leadership knowledge. Okay. The technical knowledge is all the stuff you're learning in class. The leadership stuff is all the blood and skin of what it takes to do this stuff well. So to be technically proficient and to do your job extraordinarily well, if you don't have competent, like you're going to have a transcript that says these are all your generals and all your, your courses. But there isn't a co-curricular transcript. So that's, this is my vision for American higher ed now is that we have two transcripts. We have our academic transcript and we have our leadership transcript. And that's what I did at the university. I would, I would um, help students create and we would provide letters of recommendation that would tell their employer or grad school, these are the skills that this student has acquired through a particular program. So mixing those together, when you can mix the technical and the human side together, produces the X factor. It produces the gold medal wins in your profession. But... There's lots and lots of variables for the technical side and the, and, the, and the leadership side, what I call the finding your flow side. There is all different numbers of skills that you need, and there's all different sort of human skills that you need. The question is, how do you identify which ones are the most important right now for you to acquire? So I'm going to walk you through just some of the basics. When you study the concept of flow, when people are at their very best. If you read all the books, how many have ever heard of this guy by the name of Mihaly Csikszentmihalyi? He is the original researcher on flow psychology, and he essentially studied why people um, focus and they are fully engaged in what they do. Studied artists, surgeons, athletes, leisure, you name it, from uh, motorcycle gangs in Japan to uh, Native Americans, uh, communities that tear down and rebuild for the sake of building challenge, to uh, Korean immigrant farmers and why they love farming. I mean, you name it, we've studied it around the world. Demographically, done it with teenagers, children, the elderly, professionals. You name it, they've studied it. This concept of full engagement and flow, um, is. there's been thousands of studies done. There tends to be about nine things. This is my original doctoral question. After reading a bunch of the research, but this is what the flow concepts does. This gets us into some of the big blocks of personal leadership development and leadership development in general. Number one, an activity has clear goals and objectives. So people tend to perform at their best when they have clear goals and objectives. They know what they're going after. Number two, an activity provides unambiguous feedback. 
which means that every iteration of doing something, you know what's working and what's not working without judgment so you can adjust. Number three, individual feels a sense of control where their awareness and their actions merge together. They feel like they can control the moment. Four, the individual experiences limited distractions and high concentration power. So they're able to uh, rid themselves of um, variables that are not important. And this is why I'm going to get into the concept of attentional leadership, because of all the variables in an environment and what is relevant to pay attention to in the moment versus all the distractions. And then we get into effortless performance. When things are happening well, people tend to get more jazzed up, more energized naturally. Marathoners who say they were in the zone by the end of a marathon usually could run another marathon. It's naturally engaging. You're tapping into deep resources of energies. People have an altered sense of time. Michael Jordan talked about this in, in a couple different championships, saying eight seconds on the clock, ball got smaller, hoop got bigger, I had all the time in the world to make the shot. Sometimes, anybody recognize that when you're at your very best, time speeds up? Like you're, anybody had a really good day? Anybody had a six hour day? Thought it was gonna be two, but the conversation went on all evening long. You're in that interpersonal <coughs> flow, right? Lots of different types of flow experiences we're going to talk about. Altered sense of time. Anybody been in a car accident? You ever notice time slowing down when that car got whacked, right? So the, the idea is that the human brain actually may be processing things faster than time. So we can slow down and speed up time. It's a pretty interesting phenomenon. Number seven, really important one, is a loss of ego awareness. You're so completely absorbed in an effort that who you are is not getting in the way. Anybody ever bumped up against their own self-image? Like you were doing so well at something, but you knew that this isn't really how good you were, so you started tanking or adjusting? I've seen this at the Australian Open. I watched a young Swedish boy, 16 years old, on center court playing Mats Wielander. This is back in 1987. Mats Wielander, number one tennis player in the world. What would it be like to be 16 on center court playing the number one in the world? Mats had to have been his hero. If you had to play your hero, what do you think happens? I watched, I was really curious. Is it possible for a 16 year old to beat the best in his own country? First set, I watched this 16 year old kill Matt Wielander. I mean, just 6 2. Next set, 6 1. Third set, 4 0. Oh. I'm like, this is unbelievable. How do you do this? You must have simulated this a million times, and this is what you're destined to do. And then I saw something really fascinating. I saw him start to shake. And I saw his strokes completely deconstruct. I watched him tank. The stuff you can't teach people to screw up. And I started seeing him bumping up against his self-image and saying to Prime himself, if I win, what if that, what's going to happen to me? And I watched Wielander just take him out in five steps like it was nothing. And it was this amazing moment. Anybody see the Truman Show? Anybody see that old show? The great moment where Jim Carrey starts figuring out that he's in this world. And then he, he takes the boat, he's paddling out into the edge of the universe, and he hits, he bumps up against the screen. It sort of tears the screen open. And then he rips it open and he realizes there's a big world out there. That's a lot like our self image when we're performing. I call it the elephants and fleas phenomenon, where it doesn't take much to chain an elephant to a tree. Once they test their boundaries, all you have to do is just use a small string, and they never challenge their boundaries again. Same thing with fleas. Make a flea circus, put a cup over fleas, keep it on for a while, take the cup off, they never fly outside of the boundaries of the cup. Human beings do the same thing. That's why visualization. That's why the capacity to simulate the success over and over again mimics the actual reality, you know? I've had interesting conversations with students who simulated their proposals to their you know, spouses to be and everything from sports to all types of things. Simulation is really, really important. Um, I'm gonna go. Let me get you back. Yeah, let's just gonna take a quick pause here. We tried all the different uh, yeah. Hertz's and they, 
even the lowest one seems to glitch, but it might be as good as it gets. If that's the case, we'll just keep going. So I'll just go the rest of these off the top of my head. Um, when people are in the zone of high functioning, they tend to be intrinsically motivated. Now, how many of you feel like you have outside motives and inside motives, right? We want, hey, big paycheck, we want to be noticed, we want to have power, we want to have stuff out here. The best performers that find their zone of high functioning, they do it intrinsically. They do it for its own sake. How many of you have grandmothers or grandfathers that like to make you stuff? Anybody in your family made you something? Right? Why does grandma and grandpa make you stuff? Because they love you. Right? They want to make you happy. Now let's say, who's got a, a grandmother that quilts in here? Anybody have a quilting grandmother? Or, okay, you got a quilting grandma. If you said, Grandma, I've got a great business up proposition. I've got like 25 friends. They all want quilts. Um, this cost of the quilt's 10 bucks. I'm selling them for 50. Can we make a deal? What does grandma do? She probably wouldn't do it. She's arthritis. Okay, she's got arthritis. <laughs> but she probably wouldn't want the money because you've just screwed out the most important motive of this whole thing. Okay? One of the last pieces is, and I'm going to put this on the board real quick. If we can't fix it in like well, two or three. Yeah. Um, we, we, gotta find, we can't find your presentation again. You, you can find it. Yeah, you want to just look at the presentation. Uh, just go play. Right. Now, what we had to do to get it on before is we had to unmirror, then remirror again, so the signal will pop. Either way. It did it. Oh, okay. Maybe that will do it. Okay, well, hopefully it'll, this is where we get into managing distraction, right? <laughs> this is actually part of the presentation. Oh, that's better. Mm -hmm. Is it just a cable? Yeah, um, it feels like it is. Wiggle check, yeah. What, call it maintenance. What, what is it called? Wiggle check and maintenance. Wiggle check, I like it. Okay, so here's one of the big things you'll see in flow. <laughs> Perceived capability and skill versus perceived challenge. When your perceived capability and skill is really, really high and your perceived challenge is really, really low, anybody been in that boring circumstance before? Really, really boring? What happens if you get bored too long? You get anxious and frustrated, right? How many of you have ever been in the place where your perceived challenge is really, really high and your perceived skill is really, really low? Been in a circumstance you were totally unprepared for. Anybody? Anybody been overwhelmed by multiple variety of issues? Of course we have. Flow tends to take place when our perceived capabilities and skills match our challenges. So flow is a very good predictor and indicator of when you as an individual are performing at your very best. So I'm going to start off with leading self. As I have looked at high performers, it takes more than just technical knowledge. It takes physical stuff, it takes emotional stuff, it takes mental stuff, it takes philosophical stuff, and it takes spiritual stuff. Putting it all together, I'm going to give you 12 major dimensions for which you can lead yourself more effectively. For each of these dimensions, <coughs> there are many, many sub uh, categories and lots and lots of different tools, but I'm going to run through how this model fits with you as an individual leader leading yourself, and then we're going to break it into what does it mean to do this in broader a broader leadership perspective. So, 12 dimensions of leadership. We first of all, as we lead, we're usually I call it the five internal dimensions, the five external dimensions. These are two for the individual, and we'll go to five when we do the full leadership model. And then we have five dimensions of time. I'm going to walk you through each of them briefly, and then I'm going to, I've got an assessment if you want to take it online. 
that you can do in a survey, and then I can give you tools for all of these different dimensions. So you can use them to help lead yourself better in school, work, being a mom, being a dad, and anything you want to do. But it first begins with understanding where your external environment, where you are. Context is a really important part of performance. External environment can be anything from the right city to the right arena, the right game, the right profession. I was working with a um, senior level trader at Morgan Stanley. We were analyzing all what I call, what you see is what I call the assets and liabilities of leadership. And I, we went through and almost everything was pretty solid. She's had blue, she was really, you know, she knew where she was going, she knew it. But we came to the conclusion that she was in the wrong fishbowl. It wasn't, it wasn't the right culture for her. She wanted to be in a different culture. It was, everything was right, but it was time to go to Goldman Sachs. It was time to go to you know, a New York-based firm. So context is everything. Sometimes it's, hey, this isn't the right institution. It's the wrong sport. It's the wrong major. It's the wrong field. So context plays a major role. Am I in the right arena? Okay. The next one is this. My immediate environment, right now our IE is this room. How is it organized? Okay. How, what are the variables going on in a room? If you ever study surgeons, ever, ever seen a surgical theater in prep? Everything, the lighting, the tools, the people, it's all pre-constructed to what? Induce a high level of focus on what's important in the moment. You think of all those pieces in a surgical environment, and what they're going to be working on if they're a brain surgeon is something smaller than the head of a pin. All of that has to be constructed to focus on that one thing. That's a metaphor for what we're going to talk about. How many of you feel like you've got to organize your writing space or your workspace so that it doesn't distract you? Put your iPad here, i got a little bit of music there, i got a Diet Coke, I've got... Everything's arranged so that people can leave me alone and I can get my work done. Okay? So the capacity to manage and manipulate an environment so that it allows you to focus is another critical element. Then we go into this big thing called the long future work. I break this down into three essential skills. Understanding what your mission or missions are in the future. Like what am I wanting to go get? And I look at that as a canvas with broad brushstrokes. My physical mission is to be what? They're abstract ideas. My academic mission, my family mission. It's kind of like big goal setting. <clears throat> and then we have vision, which is what does it look like if all of my missions were done? You got to be able to see those already manifested. What does it look like when I graduate from college? What does the day look like? What does it feel like? What am I going to be wearing? How am I going to interact with people? Like being able to see it. This is the big one of the big skills when we talk about visualization, is being able to see that so clearly you know how you're going to get there. And that's a present moment writing. It's writing your story. And then looking at your legacy, looking at it backwards and doing the exercise of attending your own funeral and writing all the eulogies of every you know, major person in your life and having them describe what it all looked like when it's over. So long future work is being able to see ahead in the moment and in reverse. And that's what we do with students at the, when I was doing the university stuff. We back into long future through the short future. We take our canvas with the broad brush strokes and now we paint the masterpiece and now we break our masterpiece into buckets. And we say, what are all the concrete things I want to achieve in the next 25 years, the next 10 years, the next five years, the next year, the next six months, the next three months, the next month, the next week, the next day, this hour? And do those nest together. <coughs> so can I actually reverse engineer what I see I want, break it into pieces so I know if right now I'm doing the thing I need to be doing to get towards that? recognizing that this stuff is constantly messing with your straight line from A to B, okay? 
We then go into the short past. We're going to go up into the, in, the mo in the middle of the moment. <clears throat> but this is where we execute, moment by moment. And I'm going, to, I'm going to convey to you that leadership, whether you're leading yourself or whether you're leading in relationships or whether you're leading in teams, leadership takes, it happens moment by moment, transaction by transaction. So once you've transacted something, once you've taken an exam, once you've completed a tennis match, once you have um, asked for the promotion, once you have completed a surgery, once you have attempted a sale, once you have whatever it is that you're, what I call your moments of performance, you enter into this short past and you garner feedback. What worked? What didn't work? What can I do differently? For operational lines, it's statistical process engineering. It's getting you know, corporate scorecards. It's getting any type of metric that allows you to see unambiguous feedback. It may be asking a friend, was I too harsh with Sally when we had the conversation? It's getting any type of feedback loop so that you can adjust. And then your long past. It's all of your collected moments compiling into your sort of history. This is where your self-image is comprised of. This is where your self-confidence comes from. This is where your values and your wisdom are acquired. Moment by moment, thought by thought, transaction by transaction. And I'm going to flip all this in a bit. We do it physically. So how do we engage our environment as we go through time? <clears throat> we need our physical systems in check. How we eat, the stuff we put in our body, inputs, the physical fitness, strength, aerobics, rest and recovery, sleep, meditative practice, all of these things we do to make sure that our physical foundations are solid. We do things from an emotional perspective, understanding our emotions, controlling emotions, being able to use and tap into emotions. Remember Happy Gilmore? Remember the happy place? Like, you know, I want to switch my, my anger into happiness. So how many of you feel like you could use some work in the emotional intelligence category? Understanding your own affect or emotion and being able to have strategies to adjust emotion. It's a big deal. And it's a big part of the literature today. Personal emotional intelligence, interpersonal emotional intelligence, empathetic listening, Stephen Covey's Seek First to Understand. It's all part of the emotional intelligence game. Psychological skills. <clears throat> How do you visualize? How do you manage your attitude? How do you look at problems from different angles and perspectives? How do you simulate? How do you do scenario planning? How do you do critical thinking? Okay? All types of mental competencies that are up there. These are, I'm, I've got a 60 question assessment, all the stuff's in there, I'll give it to you later. Most people forget about this one, the philosophical aspects of leadership and performance. I've been over the years collecting the life creeds of men and women. You know, and this really, the life creeds come from long past. I separate out the brain, and between God and your brain, there's philosophy. Philosophy is men's, men's and women's experiences and how we acquire knowledge. How many of you feel like you have a creed or an ethos or some type of, you know, some type of rule or standard or when you go into a situation? Like, what's your motto? Do you have a motto? Anybody have a motto in here? Or something when they go into a performance moment? Like, this is what I think about? No excuses? What, what is yours? Plan the work, work the plan. Yeah, exactly. So, say that again? Plan the work, work the plan. Plan the work, work the plan. What are other elements of philosophy? I've got dozens of these. Anybody have a, a, a motto that they use in, in the moment of performance? Yeah. A step back is a setup for a comeback. Kind of. A step back is a setup for a comeback? Okay. Awesome. That came from your experience, right? Okay. So philosophy comes from your experience. I do a 12-day trek in Peru. It's all we do for 12 days is we get lost in the Andes, and each night is a different question. And we bake our personal philosophies and leadership philosophies based on historical narrative. And then we get into the spiritual stuff. People get really fuzzy and scared about this. Oh, I'm Buddhist. I'm Jewish. I'm Islam. But very important with regards to performing because 
A lot of people are doing what they do because of something bigger than themselves. So let's not, we don't have to call it God right now. We can call it something larger than ourselves that compels us forward. Okay? And I've seen everything from prayer to religious purpose to tapping into a higher power or order. It's a big deal in the performance world. Separated out from philosophy. And this whole idea of focus. It's all about, are all these things in check so that we can focus on the most important issue of the moment? Okay? Now we're going to get into the attentional, attentional stuff. So here's the thing. Well, I want to be a better leader. Where do I start? Fact is, finding your flow. Improving your leadership potential is your own personal formula to figure out. Now that, there's a lot of variables, right? And they're all relevant. When I talk to people about the books they read, the workshops they go to, I go, why did you go to those? Well, my boss told me to go. Books sounded really interesting. Uh, somebody paid for it. How many of you have ever been to a leadership course or workshop? How many of you went to, why did you go to the workshop? <coughs> Military academies. Okay, so you're pre-trained, right? <coughs> Who else? You, 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 what kind of workshop was it? Um, was for work, I don't know, it's a lot of over the course of time. So you're told to go. How many of you felt like when you were in those workshops, you were learning the exact thing you needed for the problem or issues that, that you had at the moment? It wasn't necessarily relevant at the moment, just sometime you're going to have to deal with this, we're going to train you now, right? So your formula today is going to be very different from your formula in a month. So this is what I call the 720 degree sweep. Putting all your stuff, your internal stuff out there, and your external stuff out there, and analyzing right now what is the one thing that if you could get to your one thing and move the needle on that one thing, would shift your entire leadership equation, okay? So... Um, I'm going to give you that assessment, and that is set. I'm going to walk you through what it's going to do, but I wanted to show you this little video. Um, some of you may remember the old movie City Slickers. Anybody seen that movie? So Curly here has the answer to this question. Here it goes. Cowboy needs a different kind of life than to wear cowboys. We're a dying breed. Mean something to me, though. A couple of days, we'll move this head across the river, drive through the valley. Uh, <laughs> there's nothing like that in the herd. See, now that's great. Your life makes sense to you. <laughs> What's so funny? You're city folk. You can worry about what. My wife basically told me she doesn't want me around. You ready? <laughs> I'm just saying. How old are you now? 38. 39. Yeah. You're all in the same age, same problems. Spend about 50 weeks a year getting lots of new rope and then, then you think two weeks up here on time for you. None of you get it. Do you know what the secret of life is? No. What? This. Your finger? One thing, just one thing. You stick to that and everything else don't mean. That's great, but what's the one thing? That's what you've got to figure out. Okay, so that puts us in a bit of a sticking point. So now I'm providing you a bit of a framework and various variables and tools that um, contribute to leadership and focus and all this stuff, but where does that lead you into um, how do you become a better leader? So as I mentioned earlier, we have these sort of these two equations. We have all the knowledge we need to execute, and then we have all the different human skills we need to execute to be at our best. But some of these are more valuable than others. And our goal is to, and I'll give you the assessment on this, is to find out what is the one thing that I need today 
to move the needle on my personal performance or my leadership capacity tomorrow. And so I'll send you that link and it'll give you a 60 questions and then you can put in other pieces. But what I'm going to ask you to do is I'm just going to put out, and what I did is in my doctoral research, I, try, I, I sought to um, identify leaders and high performers in their fields. And I asked them, when you're performing and leading at your best, what's happening? And I sought to identify beyond just the, the nine core aspects of flow, uh, what's going on when people are effectively leading themselves and others? And what are those strategies? And, I, and there was about 168 discrete strategies that I came across. And I boiled them down to 60, 60 relevant questions. And so in the assessment, I'm asking you a particular question. And you have to look at it through the lens of, I want to improve my leadership in this arena now. It could be school, it could be work, it could be family, it could be church. And then answer the questions as it relates to what do you consider an asset or a liability in that area? So one of the questions may very well is, do you see and have a compelling vision for what you're trying to achieve in this particular space? And if you say, I really have no clue what my vision is for this thing, then it might be a, a liability. It's a negative five to positive five scale. So part of discovering your one thing is putting out the pieces, the internal pieces, the stuff that's going on, and the external pieces, and sorting them out and valuing them to find out what's working against me and what's working for me, and can I then identify the most important leverage point to, to change. And so with that, I have a very simple formula for finding more flow or improving your leadership potential. And that is that flow is going to equal your internal assets, the things that are inside of you that are compelling you forward, plus your external assets, divided by your internal liabilities and your external liabilities. So what would you guys consider to be an internal asset? What's an internal asset in, in, in place? Determination. Determination. Another internal asset. High energy, healthy, positive attitude, love what I do, clear vision, right? What's an external asset? What do you consider external assets? Yeah. yeah the people that surround you. Yeah, the people that surround you. Do you work well with them? Do, they, do you like who you're with? I was shocked to see that, you know, 70% people don't quit job, they don't quit um, companies, they quit managers. 70% of workforce happiness is just because of the people that they're hanging out with, right? So you need to know what your assets are. But what about internal liabilities? What are some internal liabilities? Addiction, hate your job, not challenging enough, not getting support, um, medical problems, anything that takes away from your ability to perform well. Anybody had an external liability somewhere? What are external liabilities? Bad boss, people who don't like to be around, not enough resources, hot room, you name it. Poorly organized space, not enough resources, whatever it is, right? There's all types of stuff. It's a bit rigorous. You have to decide if, for me to improve my own performance and to be a better leader, I actually kind of have to see all these pieces and sort them out so I know where to place my attention. Because most of us, try to pay a little attention to everything and get nowhere with the one thing that we need to, to move forward on. So this is where conscious incompetence becomes conscious competence. It's where we identify the one thing and build a plan around that one thing. So in addition to, so here's an example of building a formula, internal assets, an intrinsically motivated, high energy, clear mission and vision, physically healthy, positive attitude, uh, entrepreneurial spirit, supportive leaders, organized workspace, ample feedback, organization is consistent with my values, internal liabilities, emotionally struggling, time management challenges, too much stress, issues with self-confidence, not enough sleep, constant interruptions, hindered by bureaucracy, cramped workspace, not enough resources, office too warm, 
It could be anything, any variable that you, you put in your formula. And there's basically three ways to improve your leadership or to find more zone. And that is to maintain or strengthen your assets or to limit your liabilities. And some people I've seen are able to actually transform a liability into an asset. You take any number and put it there, and we, we've gotten into a strength-based uh, mindset, which is good. Everybody should be moving towards what they're good at and what they love to do. But we also have to pay attention to the things that are our stumbling blocks. A guy by the name of Jack Zenger wrote a great book called um, Leadership Excellence. And he said, you know, we should move towards our strengths. We can delegate a lot of our weaknesses, but we do have to pay attention to our fatal flaws. And there are leaders who do really, really good work, and then they have a fatal flaw that totally knocks them over. Howard Schoenfield had a fatal flaw. I played tennis with a guy in college who was destined to be in the top ten in the world. And I watched his fatal flaws take him into oblivion. Okay, so fatal flaws really need to be addressed. You need to be aware of them. So, with that, the assessment that you're going to get will all do this for you. It will ask you the questions, and at the end of those 60 questions, it'll say, what other things are relevant, either an asset or a liability, that you feel are either really helping you in this environment or really pushing back on your environment? And then once you get those, it'll rank them for you, and it'll give you a list. Your greatest assets, your greatest liabilities. Ah, you've already done the work. If you like them, keep them. If you're saying, ah, it's not really right, I really wish I would have made this a positive 5 instead of a positive 4, you can drag and drop and put them where you want them. Then the question is, okay, this is my formula. This is kind of the current reality of my situation. Now, what am I going to do about it? So from there, moving to conscious competence, it's usually an awareness gap that we struggle with, it's a knowledge gap, or it's a behavior gap. Sometimes we don't know what we don't know, we're unaware, or now we're aware, but we can do something about it. Other times, we know we have a problem with it, but we've actually never sought out the knowledge we need to deal with it. You know? Like, oh, I know that I'm really um, crass when I talk to my colleagues, but nobody's ever taught me to do it well. And so it takes intentional practice. And that's really the big key to improving performance. It's intentional practice on the right thing. Okay? And for some people, they've got the knowledge, they've got the awareness, they've just never gotten themselves to do it long enough to either improve it or to delegate it out. And so I'll also send forward a little bit of a strategy about setting a concrete goal and being able to, and for those of you who want to take it a step further, identify exactly what is it that I need to do to move the needle on that one thing. Something that's very, you know, this is a very common model for goal setting. Something that's specific. Something that's meaningful and measurable. Something that's aggressive, but it's realistic and time sensitive. So you'll get a sheet that'll look like this. And you can identify what's my greatest flow or leadership asset? What's my greatest liability? What's the one thing I need to work on? What is my one thing? Make it concrete and then rank it. And if you don't give yourself, is it, is it a specific? In fact, you write this out and give it to a friend and say, I want you to look at my goal and see if it meets this category. Is it specific enough? One to ten. Is it meaningful and measurable? That's up to you to decide. Um, is it aggressive and challenging enough? Is it, is it uh, realistic? Is it something that you can actually do? And is there a time when you can get it done? If you can get all tens on that, this is a pretty engaging one thing to work on. So what are some SMART goal examples? Spend 15 minutes each day in planning and preparation for the next 30 days. To get eight hours of sleep five nights a week each month. To learn three new ideas each day that will help me improve the relationships with my teammates. To read 20 pages per day in my professional field for the next six months. You name it, we can kind of quantify it and qualify it. Leadership development is first awareness, then it's assessment, then it's identification, then it's finding the right tools, and then it's lots and lots and lots and lots of practice. 
and then moving it and shifting it and doing the next next thing. So I actually have with my students, we're building an app for this now. You can actually do a daily scorecarding system. What am I putting in? What am I getting out? You know, how do I quantify how much of a behavior I'm going to do every day? And how am I going to measure if it's moving me in the right direction? Am I trying to increase something? Am I trying to decrease something? Am I just trying to get something done? So we can really get concrete on behavior. So that's about personal scorecarding. And then from there, we hit this idea of conscious competence to unconscious competence, where now the thing that you've been working on becomes a natural potential skill set from a leadership perspective. And from there, we can start it all over again. So it begins with self-awareness, data gathering. It goes to analysis. Then it goes to planning. Then it goes to execution and practice. Then it goes to evaluation. Then it goes to habit formation. And then repeating the concept over and over again. And then we get to start it over. So we've got about 30 minutes left. This, this was a, a one-hour summary, or a no, one-hour summary in that, on sort of the front end. Oh, we have 10 minutes. Oh, sorry, 10 minutes. So this was a, 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 a synopsis of what I normally do in a half day, which is on finding your zone of high function. Self-leadership. In the last 10 minutes, I want to then, because what I've found is that when you start looking at leading self, even though you're in a different um, level of relationship, you're dealing with mostly the same core principles as we are when you talk about finding your flow. And so making sense of now leadership is what I call the theory of attentional leadership or attentional leadership theory. So we've talked about physical and emotional and psychological and philosophical and spiritual stuff. <clears throat> but those same principles are governed in interpersonal relationships, in teams, in organizations, and communities. Think about physical self. Food, sleep. How would you apply physical to an organization? What's the blood of an organization? It's cash flow. It's the property, it's the plan, it's the equipment. There's a physical notion to the people, and there's also a physical notion to the organization. What about the physical team? Physical organization, physical community. If you are a, going to run for public office, you better know something about the physical infrastructure of your community. You better know something about the emotional makeup of your community. Right now, we have a, you know, wars are won and lost based upon the affect or the emotion of your constituents. Right? Our capacity to go in and, you know, right now this big thing, we go boots on the ground and in the Middle East, do we not? What's the, what, you know, what does the country feel about that? Right? What the psychological, the common knowledge, the common principles, the, cons, the common concepts happens in relationship, being on the same page as your spouse or your girlfriend or your boyfriend. Same with team. What are the psychological skills? Same with philosophy. What's the team philosophy? What's the organization philosophy? What is the, what is the philosophy of our country? And then the spiritual aspects. We deal with that all the time. And, and spiritual, right now between the United States and the Middle East, we got a spiritual, some spiritual clashings and spiritual interferences going on. Okay? So these five constructs go all the way through and all the way out as we talk about leadership. So let's pull out for a moment the immediate environment and the extended environment and say, you know, leadership's about all this stuff. It's about physical stuff, it's about emotional stuff, it's about mental stuff, it's about philosophical stuff, it's about spiritual stuff. It's with you in relationships and teams and organizations and communities, and all of it's passing through time. Countries are moving towards its long future, organizations are moving towards its long future, relationships, planning your marriage, planning a family. We're back into the goals, executing moment by moment, short past and long past. So, when you put it all together, it looks something like this, which is that leadership is about all these things. They're all relevant variables, and they're all intersecting. So you take them apart, and you look at underneath the hood, and you see that um, 
there's these elements, and when they come together, there's a time and a place for each one. So what is leadership? In one minute, very quickly, if you look at the leadership, there's more, there's lots of leadership theories out there. But we used to talk about the great man theory of leadership. People were born Plato, made of gold, silver, or bronze. Okay? Which meant we started looking at leadership through the lens of traits. Well, if you have certain traits, if you're just tall and you've got a good head of hair and you come from the right family, well, you're born into leadership. You've got the stuff of leadership. Chuck Yeager wrote a book called All the Right Stuff. And then we realized, gosh, people have certain traits of leadership, but they really screw up in leadership, so it's not just about traits. Oh, maybe it's about just behaviors. If we could just teach the behaviors of effective leadership, then we'll do it. But then we saw people were doing certain behaviors, but it was the wrong behavior at the wrong time. So then we got into these contingency and situational models. Well, now we're in this circumstance, do this. Now we're in this situation, do this. And so all of a sudden, leadership sort of becoming this pre-baked to, um, based on where, where we're at, whether I'm in a you know, wartime, you know, there's wartime presidents and there's peace presidents. There's, you know, there's different situations require different behaviors and different skills and different attributes. Well, I'm taking it a step further and saying it's like, uh, it's really about where you place your attention. That all of those, all of those dimensions and all of these skills are relevant at a certain time, at a certain place, for a certain duration. So here's how I boil it down. Effective leadership is knowing where and when to place your attention and how long to keep it there. Leadership is about focusing on what's important now and doing the one thing that influences a system using a process that produces a desired result. This is modern day, what I call 21st century leadership. Everything is speeding up. And you need all of it. And you need to know what you've got, what are your assets, and what are your liabilities. Because it's all relevant. There's a time and a place for each of it. There's a time and a place for you to think about yourself physically, emotionally, mentally, psychologically, you're going to have to do that in relationships, and you're going to have to do it within the context of history. You're going to need to understand your spouse's history, what happens when you certain things you do, what we're doing right now, where we're going, what's our plan for the future. You need to be able to do that with teams. You need to be able to see that within the context of an organization and within the context of the community that you're in. And you're going to have to see it all as one big system. What Ronald Heifetz at Harvard would talk about, you got to be able to stand on the balcony and look down at the dance, and then you got to be able to be in the dance. And you got to be able to shift your position. See, some people think that leadership is an outside-in phenomenon. You know, leadership is just going and influencing and getting people to do what I want to do. Other people go, no, 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 it's an inside-out phenomenon. you got to be a leader, and then you exercise the influence out. No, you have to study, you have to study, know leadership from history to know what to do. But you've got to know where you're going. The fact is you have to look at every angle all the time. You've got to see the system, multiple dimensions, and say, what do I need to pay attention to right now? Best example I can think of, oh, there's no, um, I'm going to go to the SEALs real quick. I look at leadership of today a lot like how Navy SEALs have to prepare for missions. They're different than rangers. Rangers are usually, they're trained at the same level of rigor, but they go in with a plan and they execute the plan they're given with not as much variability as they would probably like. SEALs go in with the opposite. They have very tight skills. They do very simple things extraordinarily well. They plan as best they can, but they know every moment what something's going to happen, it's going to unfold, it's going to change. So if you're a you know, Navy SEAL commander putting the attentional leadership framework in place, you may be riding with a team and wondering if you got enough sleep. Am I up for the task? How am I feeling? What's my goal? What am I thinking about right now? What's the core philosophy of me? Like, well, how am I going to be under fire? 
Am I spiritually grounded? Or do I have something bigger than me grounding me? Fred over here, what's going on with Fred? Fred, do you get enough sleep? Are you okay? What do you need? Are you in conflict with, with Jack over here? Or Jane over here? What's going on? Do you see how the team works together? Our roles and responsibilities clarified. Does everybody know what they're doing? Okay, we're going into a context. What's currently happening? We got somebody here, we got somebody here, we got a situation here, and it's constantly moving. And then I got to understand the whole context of, well, what's the political climate of what we're going into, and what do I have to be aware of? If I do this, if, if we do this, what's the ramification here? So a Navy SEAL guy has got to be able to look at the physical aspect of himself or herself or the relationships within the team, the team, the organization, and the community, and the political climate all at the same time and make decisions. So it's um, a much more rigorous framework for what are the skills and competencies of the SEALs. In the last couple minutes, I have some examples that, you know, leadership is really in the end about being aware it's about learning to identify your strengths and weaknesses, your assets, your liabilities, finding and always identifying what is the one thing you need to work on now and to move forward with it. But I also really wanted to emphasize this concept of talent is overrated. Some people think, well, am I really going to fulfill my potential? Am I really a leader? Am I really going to be the best at what I do? And there's a great book, and it's called Talent is Overrated. And I just want you to see some of these very fascinating statistics. In 1909 Olympics, 2,000 meters. The 2,000 meter gold medalist in 1909, high schoolers today do it two seconds faster. Okay? Tchaikovsky's Violin Concerto in 1878, a guy by the name of Leopold Allauer say it's unplayable by the average person, and now Juilliard students play it as admissions to get into the school. Roger Bacon, 13th century scholar, will take 40 years to master calculus. Now students do it in high school. Albert Einstein, not the smartest scientist, poor experimenter, dissertation rejected two times. Colin Powell, poor student, became chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. We overestimate talent. It's important, 50% of, the, 50 of the, your formula, but the other 50% is extremely variable. So with that being said, um, I wanted to also mention one last piece, and that is being a leader also requires good followers. Um, we are in one minute. This is kind of a fun video. Uh, anybody seen the Building a Movement video about inside-out leadership and what it takes? Uh, if you want to watch it, you can stay. If, uh, it's, it's, about, it's about three minutes. Okay. That's good. If you've learned a lot about leadership and making a movement, then let's watch a movement happen start to finish in under three minutes and dissect some lessons. First, of course, a leader needs the guts to stand alone and look ridiculous. But what he's doing is so simple, it's almost instructional. This is key. You must be easy to follow. Now here comes the first follower with a crucial role. He publicly shows everyone else how to follow. Notice how the leader embraces him as an equal. So it's not about the leader anymore. It's about them, plural. Notice how he's calling to his friends to join in. So it takes guts to be a first follower. You stand out and you brave ridicule yourself. Being a first follower is an underappreciated form of leadership. The first follower transforms a lone nut into a leader. If the leader is the flint, the first follower is the spark that really makes the fire. Now here's the second follower. This is a turning point. It's proof the person has done well. Now it's not a lone nut, and it's not two nuts. Three is a crowd, and a crowd is news. A movement must be public. Make sure outsiders see more than just the leader. Everyone needs to see the followers, because new followers emulate followers, not the leader. Now here come two more people, then three more immediately. Now we've got momentum. This is the tipping point, and now we have a movement. As more people jump in, it's no longer risky. If they were on the fence before, there's no reason not to join in now. They won't stand out, they won't be ridiculed, and they will be part of the in-crowd if they hurry. But over the next minute, you'll see the rest who prefer to stay part of the crowd, because eventually they'd be ridiculed for not enjoying it. And ladies and gentlemen, that is of how a movement is made. So let's recap what we've learned. If you are a version of the shirtless dancing guy, all alone, remember the importance of nurturing your first few followers as equals, making everything clearly about the movement, not you. 
be public, be easy to follow. But the biggest lesson here, did you catch it? Leadership is over glorified. Yes, it started with the shirtless guy, and he'll get all the credit, but you saw what really happened. It was the first follow that transformed a lone nut into a leader. There's no movement without the first follow. See, we're told that we all need to be leaders, but that would be really ineffective. The best way to make a movement, if you really care, is to courageously follow and show others how to follow. When you find a lone nut doing something great, have the guts to be the first person to stand up and join in. All right, so that being said, we'll, uh, hopefully you'll recognize that uh, there's lots of various principles and tools for you to become a leader in yourself and what it means to do that in a relationship. And what does it mean to do that in teams? The number 788,400 is how many hours you live if you died on your 90th birthday. So think about those moments and are you constantly garnering the skills that you need, not just the technical stuff, but the human stuff, so that you can lead yourself, lead in relationships and teams and organizations in your communities to be more effective. And for those of you who would like the tools and the assessments, I will send those to Rick. And uh, feel free at any time to give me a call or send me a note. And we've covered probably 20 hours of content. You've been very good about it. I hope it's um, opened up your aperture to at least garner your awareness and interest. And would be happy to uh, support you as you continue on your leadership development journey. So have a great day and thanks for uh, coming today. Thank you.